Vivaki. Sounds good. Um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share the, the text, the screen. And you guys should be seeing both texts. The left side of the page, which I will highlight right here. This is the Jai Deva Singh uh, translation of the sutra. And the right side of your page, which is at the very bottom there, is the uh, Lakshmanju Sutra. I hope the font is big enough for you to read. Um, anybody having technical problems seeing those? Oh, and one thing I have to mention at this point, when I'm sharing my screen, I can only see five or six windows at the top at a time. It's unfortunate. Um, but uh, So that means when you want to contribute or say something, um, just say like your name, just unmute yourself and say your name. Um, and then just, uh, or just start talking, you know, uh, but I won't be able to see like a hand. And so just so you have a sense of how to contribute. And um, what we're going to do is just sort of read this text uh, together, pause for reflective questions. And if everything goes well, we might even have time for a breakout room because that's everybody's favorite thing to do is hang out with each other. So um, let's start. Uh, so for me, um, I'm just reading across the list of names I have at the top. Um, I have uh, Roseanne. Do you want to try unmuting? I know it's, it can tend to be, if it's a little noisy there, we can go to some. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Oh, I'll get that. Quiet as a yeah, quiet as, <laughs> as a mouse. Yeah. So we're gonna start right. the uh, Jai Davis Singh. Huh? That's that was a weird echo. Um, and so you would read um, right here up until uh, Sutra Ten. Actually, let's have you read all the way through that highlighted portion. Go for it. Okay. When the yogi is not always on the alert, then even in the case of one who has acquired knowledge of the self, there is on the flagging of attention. And that's leading up to the sutra itself, and you can just read it as it is at the bottom of the screen, and then we'll do the Sanskrit together later. Okay, so I'm having a hard time. On the, on the submergence of Sudha, Sudha Vidya, there is an appearance of thought construct arising from it. All right, so we'll start there. Um, so we've got just two uh, phrases of, of Sanskrit words grouped together there. We, the first Sanskrit word, um, vidya samhara. Um, it would be too hard for everybody's mics to be on, so just try it at home on your own. Vidya samhara. Vidya. Vidya Samhara, yeah. or I guess it could be Vidya Samhare, which because the E sound. In any case, Vidya Samhare, and then we'll do the next, uh, and that is referring to this first section here on the submergence of Shuddha Vidya. So you can see the key term Vidya, Vidya, and then sam, Samhare would be the submergence of. Submerging means when that thing becomes sort of like, you know, when it goes under, when it becomes submerged, um, go like something going underwater. Then it says the next phrase, ta du ta ta du ta Try that. ta du ta ta du ta ta du ta And then a word we've seen a lot, swapna. Swapna. Swapna, that means uh, thoughts or dreams. And then darshanam, darshanam. Tadata swapma darshanam. Tadata swapma darshanam. And then one time the whole sutra, vidya samhare tadata swapma darshanam. One more time. Vidya Samhare Taduta Swapna Darshanam. Vidya Samhare Taduta Swapna Darshanam. You know, more and more I'm realizing that these sutras were written in, in such a way that you could remember them. You know, these short, short phrases where, where it seems definitely intentional that you that they would be written in such a way that you could carry them with you. You could remember them, you know, 
that they're almost like you could put them in your pocket of your mind. So on the submergence of Shuddha Vidya, there is the appearance of thought constructs arising from it, meaning when Shuddha Vidya is submerged, thoughts arise. And um, next we're gonna we're gonna read a little bit more from Jayadeva Singh before going over to Lakshmanju. Um, on my screen, Devaki, you're actually next. Could you read um, this highlighted text? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. On the submergences of Sudha Vidya, pure over mental knowledge, there is appearance of all kinds of thought constructs arising from it, i.e., from the submergence of Sudha Vidya. Yeah. So it's a classic Jai Davis Singh paragraph with multiple parentheses and restatements of itself. It's really classic. So on the submergence of Shuddha Vidya. So Shuddha Vidya is obviously a big part of the sutra. Um, here he's translating it as pure over mental knowledge, over mental. Um, it seems like a literal translation there that he's getting at. You know how you can literally translate things sometimes like above the mind knowledge. So I think that's how I would interpret it. You guys are welcome to throw out other interpretations, but pure knowledge that is above the mind. He says, so when that knowledge that is above the mind is submerged, he says, all kinds of thought constructs, all kinds of thoughts start to arise. And so take a second here and just let's reflect uh, for a moment. Shuddha Vidya, this over mental knowledge. Um, earlier in Sutra 2.5, we saw this term, um, vidya, and it was also translated as supreme knowledge of non-dualism. Supreme knowledge of non-dualism, and something that we've learned about non-dualism is that it, it cannot be understood by the mind, meaning that the mind is inherently dualistic. It cannot reflect really. It cannot really see itself. Only awareness can do that. So the mind can't understand non-dualism. The mind can't understand all of reality. Um, so this represents knowledge that is beyond the mind. Knowledge that is beyond the mind. And I just want to just take a moment, um, 30 seconds, for you guys to breathe with that and ask yourself, what, is, what does that mean? What kind of knowledge, what kind of knowledge is something that is beyond the mind's capacity to even know it. So just take a couple of breaths with that, how you understand Shuddha Vidya. And continuing to breathe with it, does anyone want to share? And um, hopefully that was just enough time to get to give you a little bit of space. I know I'm sort of pushing it. Does anyone want to share what how they understand this this kind of knowledge in, in their practice? And I don't mean like from a textbook perspective, but like has your practice yielded something you would call shoot a video for you, a knowledge that is beyond your mind? And again, you'll have to say, you'll just have to say it. I can't see your hand. Hi, Tim. It's Tulsi. Hey, Tulsi. Hey. Um, I would say it's pretty simple for me, just um, heart and intuition. So your practice has given you uh, an ability to directly relate to your heart and your intuition um, in a way that does not necessarily go through the mind or is not limited by your mind. It's somehow you can relate to those things in a yep. different, yeah. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> and, and I think that was probably the way you would have to answer that because it's not about the mind. It's that Tim's column. Yes. Um, so I'm going to do my best to explain it very quickly. But it's like meditation is still a function of the mind because it's like focus, you know, it's, a, it's still using the mind to focus on something. And then ideally the other place like emerges shows itself when things slow down so i'm probably not i'm trying to explain it but it's almost like the attempt to meditate can in it in and of itself be a thought and somehow even surrendering that is when I've experienced what I think is just outside of the mind. So you started, you're saying the meditation is, and that is exactly what the Shakti Upaya is telling us over and over again, is that the Shakti Upaya is about harnessing the mind. Mantra is about giving the mind something to focus on. So meditation is work for your mind. And then you were saying, I think the key word in what you're saying was that this knowledge emerges from the practice. It's not necessarily like the mind m makes it happen, but rather by focusing the mind, this type of knowledge emerges. Does that sound right? Totally. And, and you know, like Baba. Go ahead. Baba says sometimes like, all right, you, you, you use the car to get somewhere and then mm -hmm. you don't, get to the parking lot and then sit in it. You like get out of the, <laughs> yeah. get out of the car. Yes. So it's almost like when that place emerges, I've experienced this thing where I can actually almost like go backwards to focusing on the mind mm. instead of just like somehow kind of like falling into it, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think the way that you were describing it uh, perfectly aligns with how it was described in Sutra 2.5. It says, it says the spontaneous emerge, and this is five sutras ago. It described Shuddha Vidya, Shuddha Vidya as the spontaneous emergence of knowledge. Spontaneous, meaning you're sitting there doing your practice and you can't make it happen. And it just has to happen on its own. And then emergence, meaning it didn't necessarily come directly from what you're doing. It came as a result of what you're doing. It emerged from it. So I think, yeah, those are, this is the direction that the sutras are trying to help us. I think I cut someone off. Did someone want to jump in there? I, I thought I heard someone's voice when I started talking. It was yeah. Stephanie. Oh. I just, I feel like I might have had an experience with what Colin was talking about the other night. I was out walking and this is why I was asking about mantra the other night. Um, but I was doing my mantra while I was walking with my dog and then it just like everything melted away and I was extremely present and exactly where I needed to be. But then the repetition of the mantra actually like brought me back out of that place. So kind of like the mind became a thought unto itself and brought me back out. Mm. Wow. Interesting. That's a very... Exactly what he meant. Yeah, that's a that's that's getting into the most subtle aspects of what we're what we're looking at here. Yeah, I think you're really pointing in the right direction. Hey, Satyam. Hey, Shambo, go for it. I had something very similar, and when you say emerging after as a result of practice, yeah, um, uh, just like a feeling. Uh, feeling just touching on this feeling mm. or I had this feeling the other night of clarity just a clear mm. sense of clarity in my whole being that uh, had nothing to do with anything um, of thought or words 
hmm. I think, but just that feeling uh, after doing a lot of practice, or just maybe uh, being half asleep, waking up in the middle of the night with us, with a good feeling of uh, just a very secure, positive, happy feeling for no reason. But uh-huh. just kind of a, a feeling in, in the whole being, not just a mental state. Right. A deep, a deep feeling in a moment. Well, that's a very, very helpful analysis, Shambo. Thank you. That really puts a lot of things into perspective, calls back to Tulsi's original you know, comment as it being like an experience of the heart, an experience of intuition, and you're talking about how it's an experience of, of clarity, of a feeling of something that is itself beyond the mind, which would definitely be pointing to awareness itself. And I really love how you brought in Babaji's, you know, sort of like go-to statement that we all probably, I know for me, it was like one of those things that I heard for years and just couldn't even wrap my mind around happy for no reason. I think that's a really, uh, that's a really great way to look at it in a practical way that Babaji's presented it to us so many times. Hmm. Happy for no reason. I mean, that really points to it. It's like a feeling that is beyond reason. It's something that you can relate to that is that the mind cannot grasp. So so Shuddha Vidya and Shuddha Vidya, again, if you look back at the, um, I'll just make this text a little bigger. Um, if we look back, Vidya is really the word that we're seeing in the sutra. And it's saying when that Vidya, when that knowledge, when that feeling, when that experience is submerged, submerged. So, this experience is submerged. Ah, it's such an, where does it, how does it become submerged? You know, it's like, it was sort of rising up. It's almost like it, it rises up and then submerged means it's sort of like, ah, sort of falls back in. And then when it falls back in, it's not like nothing's there to replace it. This sutra is saying thoughts are immediately there dreams are immediately there to replace it um and then and this is something we can actually we could look over let's look over at uh it's funny every time i say one thing i know the very next minute i'm going to say the opposite let's look over at lakshmanju um and his interpretation um that, that's the last sutra almost there he talks right here about this same portion of the sutra. And um, let me just check out. Um, Rudrani, you're next on my list. Could you read this paragraph for us? That's highlighted on the right. Sure. Um, Okay. This is the meaning of this sutra. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. When you've completely entered in samadhi, and you do not maintain your awareness wholeheartedly with great effort, then after a while, you enter into the dreaming state. This happens to all yogis. This losing awareness is the great crisis in the yogic world. All yogis generally experience this state of losing awareness. And when they do, they go to the dreaming state because that state is subtler than the waking state. Thank you so much. Um, So uh, I don't know. I got to say, I found this phrase to be sort of a little bit comical and, and wonderful in its own way. This losing awareness is the great crisis in the yogic world. Man, I bet you at the heart of most of our questions we ask Babaji, it's probably, this is probably the question we're asking him the most. How come I just can't keep my awareness on the practice? It's just like all I'm supposed to do is this practice and then keep 
flagging attention. But yeah, the great crisis in our yogic world is losing awareness. It happens to all of us and all yogis experience this state of losing awareness. And he says, and when they do, and uh, they go to the dreaming state. So he's referencing and saying that when pure knowledge is submerged, that is basically another way of saying when we lose awareness. And then he's saying, um, then when you lose awareness, you enter into the dreaming state. Um, what do you guys, you ever really, you ever really reflect on losing awareness? You know, like you're just sitting there. It's like, have you ever really sat down and been like, I want to do my practice right now. And it almost seems like it's not up to you <laughs> on some level. It's like such an interesting battle that we embark upon every day in our practice. You know, take a couple of breaths. Oh, go ahead or jump in. Go ahead. It, it kind of takes me back to what Babaji said um, last week was that being unconscious would be really dangerous right now <clears throat> with mm -hmm. this given situation. Um, just allowing our awareness to lapse at all. Mm -hmm. Well, that really, that's really, uh, I think that really calls, uh, speaks to this, to the Lakshmanju and calling it a crisis, calling it something serious, calling it something that really is what prevents us from, you know, getting to where we're wanting to go. It really is the greatest obstacle is what yeah. he's sort of alluding to here. And you're putting it into really great real world terms of what happens when you lose your awareness. I mean, it's true. And it's sort of like why situations like this tend to uh, be opportunities for growth, right? I've heard Babaji say so many times when things got intense is when he grew the most because he just buckled down into his practice. And I don't know if you guys feel similarly right now, but it's almost like the, sit the, the situation we're presented with, I think you put it really well, referencing Babaji's quotes is, suddenly we're presented with a situation where if we, if, if our awareness, if we do lose our awareness, there's consequences, you know, even if it's just like germs, uh, touching your face, being outside and, you know, losing your awareness and just grabbing a door handle with your bare hand. You know what I mean? Like suddenly awareness has, um, a, uh, value, a real, a real life value. Yeah, and this would be a really bad time to um, just g go around somewhat carelessly and, you know, for instance, break your arm and right. then have to go to the emergency room because that's not a place you want to be right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, here we are all. Uh, at philosophy class on Thursday. Yes, maybe because some of us finally have the time because maybe you're not at your job that you'd normally be at. But um, here we are all investing in our awareness, literally in this very moment. It's literally the practice we're doing in this, in this moment. Hey, Sajam, it's Anju. Can you guys hey, Anju. Me? Yeah, go for it. I was going to say the interesting thing when I've been kind of going through this sutra for me as well is that there's kind of that difference between like really focused willful awareness, right? Of like, got to remember not to touch the door him. Can't do this. Can't do that. And how that can be like really anxiety riddled if you think about awareness from an intellectual standpoint. But when you can get really centered and, you know, those like the heart and, you know, your, your navel chakra and stuff, and you're coming from that place, so it becomes kind of effortless. You don't think about not touching the door handle, but you're consciously not doing it because you're so present in yourself versus being up in your mind and kind of running that reel over and over again and getting yourself sort of worked up. And I feel like this future for me really pulls me down into like awareness, not being a mental or mindful faculty in some ways. Hmm. I'm just sitting with that for a moment.
that's a, I think you really touched on, um, uh, you sort of, you sort of touched, it feels like you touched on something pretty big there because we, we are awareness, right? I mean, according to Kashmir Shaivism, that's the fundamental thing we are, is our awareness. So how could you lose it? And so when you come, when you're trying to cultivate awareness through the mind, it, I see what you mean. It can really lead to anxiety because um, it's almost like you can never be aware enough uh, if you're coming from the mind. Does that feel like it's sort of in the same direction that you were talking, Anju? Yeah, but much more succinctly. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, just want to make sure I felt I was feeling you on that and not putting words in your mouth, but wow. You know, that's really, that's really, we just throw the term awareness around. Like it's something that you uh, can have or not have and cultivate and not cultivate. And on a certain level, it definitely is. But if you, if you come back to the sutras, it's the only thing where we can really count on that. We always are is our awareness. It's so interesting and trying to cultivate awareness through the mind leads to anxiety. That was a really, it's really insightful. Something I feel like I would, I would need to almost work with for like a little while to, to fully comprehend or to like work with in my day. If anyone else has a comment on that or, or a comment on, you know, the concept, go for it. This is Stephanie. Um, I just have an analogy coming to my head and apparently everything's exercise related today. Um, but when you're running and you're just like, okay, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm breathing really heavy, I'm breathing really heavy. And then you get through that and you like hit this plateau and you're like, oh, hey, this is easy. I'm here, I'm doing good. But then because you've eased, you're not pushing as hard and you actually lose pace and you fall back down to that place of where you're like mm. pushing to know that you can get there. But then you're like, oh, I'm gonna relax. Oh no, I can't relax. And finding that play and finding that balance of that effort and that ease once again, but this time in your awareness so that you're not hitting that point and then relaxing back into that ease state. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's interesting when you're relying on the effort to get you there. It's almost like the pendulum swings, right? Mm -hmm. If pure effort gets you to the place where you want to be, then it's almost like the pendulum swings to pure ease. And what you said to relax, that actually uh, you fall back and then pure effort and then pure ease and pure effort and pure ease until we finally start to work for both. You know, finally, when we start to work for both and it sometimes it requires us to suspend our um, where, you know, our trajectory that we think we should be on uh, in order to really pay more attention to the uh, the means that we're reaching on in our meditation practice. That's an interesting analogy to pull into meditation to try and relate to that, like when you're trying to focus on your mantra when you're coming at it from a place of pure effort, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. It's like, yeah, I can get myself to focus on it. I'm saying it loud. I'm saying it quickly, not giving myself any time to like not think it. But it's like, you know, but what happens when you run out of steam like that? Because you will, then it's almost like your mind drifts even more quickly. It's just, yeah, I like that analogy and really relating it to our practice specifically mantra because it's something we can really do and feel um, and seeing are you repeating with pure effort or is there are you repeating in a way that's sustainable hmm. any other comments on this portion before we move on is that Tim Colin real quick um, hey. There's been times, just kind of tagging along with what a few people are saying, there's been times where I've been 
working with something, maybe in my navel or whatever, and kind of get over focused on it and it gets stuck. And then I'll like, some noise will happen outside or I'll get yanked away real quick. And when I come back, I noticed that something's moved a little bit. And so it, there's something, I, I don't know, I'm not like, I, don't, I definitely don't have an answer here, but there's, I've noticed recently, especially and with what everyone's saying, like there seems like there's something to being able to be as uninvolved as when you're distracted, but like be that level of uninvolved while being conscious. You know what I mean? Like it's that weird balance that seems to like be pretty powerful. I'm going to have to repeat that last part again. It's like being as uninvolved and hands off, like try, you know, surrendered as when you're not, as when you're distracted. Uh, but like being uh, that surrendered <laughs> consciously. When you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. that. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. It's like, why can't I, I'm sitting here trying to meditate and relax and then I relax more when I just go to see what the dog's barking at and suddenly I'm not that that little thing in my gut's not there and then I sit down to meditate again and then I make that little knot in my gut like instantly. Isn't that yeah. something? Huh. That's a real you're right. That's a really I think a lot of people can relate to that really interesting phenomenon of meditation. Hmm. And that's interesting in relation to this sutra because it talks about, I don't know if I can pull it all together in this moment, but the idea of like things being submerged and, and then rising uh, up. And it makes me think of when Rudy says that, you know, when you meditate, you might be more uncomfortable, but it's just because you're peeling away the, the junk you were living with. And it's almost like when you sit up to go look at what the dog's barking at and the knot goes away, does it really go away, you know, or does it just become covered by these thought constructs and these appearances outside of us, like the sutra is saying? And then when you sit back down and you start to focus on your practice again, knowledge rises up, and this knowledge is actually showing you something that you'd be better off without. And so, of course, we, 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 we feel like we are experiencing that state when we get up from the cushion, but from whatever all the lineage teachers have told us, it appears that um, really all that's happening is what the sutra says, taruta swapma darshanam, thoughts rise up and cover up what really needs to be taken care of. But nonetheless, there's a valuable experience in there when you have that moment, that glimpse of, of not having that, that, that knot. It gives you just that little bit of space to start working with it in a new way. So it has its own value for sure. Because you sit down and you don't go right after the knot. You know, you're like, no, I don't have to feel just that. So that's valuable too hmm a lot of wonderful comments tonight this is a uh, particularly um, awesome anything else on this section before we move on I don't want to rush anybody um, is that a hand or no oh yeah yeah we'll get to it shouldn't I don't just in case somebody's been waiting um, so Baya keeps me honest here, and she always tries to remind me that um, it's important to meditate uh, as in our groups and not just, you know, simply talk. Um, I do want to just uh, point back real quick to uh, the Jai Deva Singh translation because the, um, the actual sutras, you know, uh, quite, quite short here, basically... <laughs> It's really just this one paragraph that we read together uh, describing of the translation. And then there is, some, there is some commentary about it for sure that you guys should read. But it really is pointing to a very, very straightforward concept that we've been alluding to. There's a little bit more in there about um, that the teacher, sh that 
that certain things can only be understood um, or uh, given to you when your teacher is pleased. You guys can read about that. I think that's an interesting section that comes up. Um, uh, like for example, the Millarepa story where Millarepa really wanted these certain te that's not in this section, but the story of Millarepa is, can help you understand this concept. It says that, uh, yeah, the teacher must be fully pleased for you to understand something. The idea for Millarepa was that he really wanted these teachings, wanted them so bad and his teacher just wouldn't give them to him. He thought he still had more work to do. And then he got the teachings because um, Milarepa's wife felt bad for him. No, because Milarepa's teacher's wife felt bad for him. So she gave him the teachings, but they wouldn't work until his teacher gave it to him when he was fully pleased. And so that does seem to be a theme in the yogic tradition. Now, for each of us, we have different relationships to this concept. Not all of us, you know, necessarily have a teacher yet. Some of us are just beginning our journey. Um, and so that's an interesting aspect that came up that you guys can read about on your own. And then I um, just want to see if there's anything else I wanted to touch on. There was one last thing, and I'll just allude to this, but there's this guy, Bhaskara, Bhaskara Acharya, sometimes he's called. Um, he lived in like the 1100s, which is like 100 years or so after um, Shamaraja, or maybe he was even a contemporary, roughly like generationally. But he interprets this sutra and others before it often in the opposite way, <laughs> where it's not like the opposite meaning, but he interprets them differently and they reference him a lot in here. So he, he must be pretty noteworthy. But he basically said uh, that he thought that this sutra uh, was, was to be translated that, um, that we're actually shedding, we're actually shedding common ordinary knowledge um, in, in order uh, upon practicing you shed this ordinary knowledge of life and you look back at it like it was a dream like you can't even realize you can't even relate to it anymore you're like the stuff that I cared about before I started meditating regularly you're like I can't believe that was all I cared about and I thought that was a very noteworthy interpretation that you can you can read about here as well um, and something you could probably reflect on in your own life you're like oh yeah that's true my life before meditating almost seems like a dream. Hmm. So any last questions or comments before we meditate together? Because we just have 15 minutes left. So I mean, it went, it went insanely fast. I can't believe it. I, I just want to say I kind of like that interpretation because it feels to me like when you recognize your thought constructs as being constructed by your mind, they just sort of do dissolve and then they're not, they don't seem as real anymore. Mm, yeah. Mm. Just sitting with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even the word thought construct, almost like there are these little um, Lego kind of thoughts that you can be just taken apart, you know, and that they're just assembled arbitrarily, you know, that they don't really have an existence unto themselves. So that's really a valuable perspective and something that can really help when you're, when you're practicing to, to view the thoughts as just constructs that can be dissolved. Anyone else to, as we come to a close, a couple minutes? So um, it's always hard to talk after meditating. So I'll just say this last couple words is the purpose of this hour together is um, to get you excited about the sutra, but the sutras are meant to be, meant to be studied inwardly you know, unto yourself, like uh, they're meant to be studied this way too, but a crucial part of the practice is you uh, encountering the text within and using your practice and just sort of going over it and, and feeling and trying. 
yes, they're abstract. Yes, they don't always appear interesting at first. What I found though is read it, let it sort of soak, come back to it a couple days later, a day later, read it again, and then I'm gonna plant the seed, write about it, write about it, take a section, interpret it. It's the fun part. That's the part that keeps this thing growing. So I'm gonna offer that opportunity um, this Saturday. I'll put up a post, I'll have a post first thing in the morning in Colorado that just says reflections on the sutra. You know, what stands out to you in either of the, uh, in either of the interpretations? You know, what stands out to you? And it's an opportunity to take a sentence, take a couple of sentences, and just interpret it. And you'd be surprised that it's almost like doing a little drawing or writing a little riff or, you know, doing a little dance or writing a yoga sequence. It really brings out this other aspect. Uh, it's, and it's a fun way to work with it. So I'll just plant that seed now so I don't have to talk like that after meditating. Any, uh, any last thoughts before you meditate? All right. Well, I am so grateful to have everybody here, and it's so wonderful to see everybody's faces. Um, we have 10 minutes together, which is really special. And so if you need to make any adjustments to your seat, do so. And this is such a great opportunity. Um, so as you come into your seat, right away, and if you just, you know, I know this might seem a little, you know, remedial, but right away, just let yourself move a little in your spine, almost like you're like uh, being pushed around by a current in the water. And try to feel in this moment the amount of effort that you use to do this. Try to feel the effort you're using. And notice how it's quite a perfect balance of effortless effort. It's like you're using effort, but it's purely relaxing. And so just very gently allow this movement to almost like arrive at stillness, almost like you're in a pool of water and the current just sort of slows down. And you can take that effortless effort into your seat. It feels like you just float into stillness. Babaji often describes a meditation seat like uh, balancing on the head of a pin. Maybe you can relate to that here. And how do we maintain this focus, this level of focus? How do we maintain this stillness? Is it through pure effort? Is it through pure relaxation? Notice if you have your internal sights set on the Shuddha Vidya form of stillness, the pure knowledge form that is beyond the mind, you are not just focusing on the effort, you're focusing on the experience, the experience of stillness. And all of your energy can flow towards that experience directly
And similarly with the breath, you can swallow, giving the breath a little bit more room to make its way to the heart. Using very, very minimal effort to just smooth out the breath, similar to the minimal effort to make your seat very still. Allow yourself to focus on the experience of breathing. This requires effort, but it also requires feeling at the same time. And finally, bringing your mantra to the breath. And with the same intention of not just repeating the mantra, which would be a mental effort of mantra, but repeating it while hearing it, while feeling it experiencing the mantra.
and you're welcome to uh, bring the hands together at the heart and let the hands just sort of touch right there at the center of the chest. And we'll finish with three internalized ohms where you just sort of hum internally the ohm sound. And so you take a slow breath in through the nose and then feel the vibration of the ohm as you hum it. Another deep breath. And one more time. Namaste, my incredible Sangha. Thank you guys so much for making this possible. It was uh, really awesome to have everybody here. <laughs>